what we're conscious of is, of course, not a direct readout of what happens to be out there in our world, in our environment. It's a construction. It's an active interpretation of the sensory data that comes into our, to our senses. There's many beautiful ways to illustrate this. This is always one of my favorite. This is called the lilac chaser illusion. And I'm hoping it works on your screens wherever you're watching this from. But if you just have a look at the black cross and um, hold your gaze and don't blink, then you should see all the magenta patches disappear and be replaced by a single green patch rotating around. And then if you move your eyes and blink, the green patch disappears and magenta patches turn up again. Of course, there is no, there is no green disc at all. There's only magenta patches that disappear one after the other. And so this is, um, this is a combination of actually three different effects in visual perception. But the main point is simply that the brain is making its best interpretation that there's a green patch there where there is no green patch there. Huh. So the general idea to understand what's going on, not only in these unusual situations of, of visual illusions, but all the time in visual perception is the idea that your brain is a kind of prediction machine and that perceptual content is the content of your brain's best prediction or best guess about the causes of sensory input. And if you think about what it's like to be a brain, you're stuck inside a bony skull, you've got no direct access to what's out there in the world at all. All you get are these sensory signals, which are noisy and ambiguous and only indirectly related to things in the world. And so to come up with a kind of definite perceptual content, we all have the experience of, 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 of a scene which kind of unambiguously contains images and objects and people and things, colors and shapes, they have definite properties. So to convert this ambiguous sensory uh, environment into this perceived world with its definite properties, we can think of perception as this process of inference where this ambiguous data is combined with what the brain is expecting to be out there. And then it's the brain's best guess modulated by the sensory input that is what we, what we see. Now, there's many examples of this process of sort of perceptual informed guesswork. Uh, I'll give you just one. These are called two-tone figures or Mooney figures. Um, if you haven't seen this image before, it should hopefully just look like a random mess of black and white uh, splotches with no particular structure or organization. But if I fill the image in, you can see that it's actually a, a meaningful scene. There's a horse and a woman with a hat on, and there's at least three objects in this scene organized in a particular way. Now, if I drain the color again from it, um, you should still be able to see echoes of the woman and the horse in those black and white patches. What the point here is that the sensory data hasn't changed. All that's changed is your brain's best guess about the cause of that sensory data, and that changes your conscious experience. So this is all kind of just illustrative of this idea that the brain is bringing to bear predictions or expectations that shape what we perceive. Now, in, in neuroscience, this idea of the brain as a prediction machine is typically thought of in the context of what people call predictive processing. And this is a theory about how the brain actually reaches these best guesses, how it, how it, how it achieves this process of taking ambiguous sensory data and converting it into a, a definite perception. And the idea basically is that perceptual content is conveyed not by reading out sensory signals, but it's conveyed by the collective top-down predictions that are anticipating the ongoing sensory flow all the time. And that bottom-up signals, sensory signals that come into the brain through the eyes, the ears, and all our senses, they're not read out. They convey prediction errors that simply report the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every stage of processing. So whereas we normally think of perception as read out from the outside in, this perspective says it's the other way around, that what we perceive is coming from the inside out or the top down. And sensory signals merely or mainly calibrate 
our ongoing, ever-changing perceptual best guesses by minimizing prediction errors. So if the brain is continually updating its predictions to try and get rid of these red arrows, these prediction error signals, that's what allows the brain to reach a best guess about the causes of its sensory signals. Um, more formally, it means that the brain is approximating something called Bayesian inference. So it's doing, it's, it's making its optimal guess about the, about the causes of the sensory data that it receives. This is again, a little bit more of a detail, doesn't really matter that much, but the, the basic idea is that prediction errors, sensory signals flow, the red arrows flow from the outside in or the bottom up and predictions flow in the top down or the inside out. And it's the combined content of the predictions that is what we perceive. Now, there's a bunch of evidence that's consistent with this view. I'll just give you a couple of simple examples. This was a study with the Aya Pinto from a few years ago. One of the predictions you might make with this view is that we consciously see what we expect to see more accurately, more quickly um, than what we don't expect to see, because our prediction errors would be minimized more quickly if the sensory data are compatible with, ex with our brain's expectations. And this is indeed, in this experiment, what we find. So what we did here was we took, we had people and we showed them in one eye an image. In this case, it's an image of a face which gradually appears. And in the other eye, there are all these changing colored squares which gradually get dimmer and dimmer. And so what happens is the image breaks through into your conscious perception um, after some time. And what we found is that it breaks through faster and more accurately when it's what you expect to see compared to what you don't expect to see. So this is some evidence that, that we see what we expect rather than what we don't expect more quickly uh, and more accurately. And, but this is a boring sort of lab experiment. And perhaps more interesting is how does this apply um, out there in the real world? How deeply does it shape our everyday experiences? And we're all aware of this process to some extent. Whenever we see things like faces and clouds, that can be understood as the brain imposing its expectations into some ambiguous sensory data. There's no actual face in the cloud, of course, but we see a face in the cloud because the brain comes preloaded with strong expectations to see faces everywhere it can. Uh, and so to try and understand a bit more about how expectations might shape perceptual experiences in general, um, we've been developing an approach calling computational phenomenology, which is basically building computational models of different kinds of perceptual experience. And the first thing we did here, and this has been around for a little while now, you might have seen uh, this already, is that we took one of these off-the-shelf neural networks. This is called AlexNet. It's a neural network, consists of a number of layers, and it's very good at classifying objects in images. You can show an image, and it will tell you what objects are in it. And it operates in a feed-forward or bottom-up way. So you show it the image, and activity goes up through the network, and it comes up with one sort of activation at the top level, which tells you what's in that image. But the clever people at Google realize that if you run it backwards, then you can basically um, project an expectation into the image itself. So now instead of updating the classification about what's in the image, you update the image until the network settles into a stable state. Google, they call this uh, the deep dream algorithm. And what we did at Sussex is we took that algorithm and we applied it to panoramic video taken on Sussex campus. And uh, this is work with Kesuke Suzuki uh, in the lab. And so this was a panoramic video that we had um, on a non-pandemic Tuesday at Sussex. And uh, we processed every frame of the, the movie through this adapted deep dream algorithm and stitched them together. And people would watch the panoramic video through a headset so that it responded to their head movements. And you can see that it comes up with a very strange experience here. There's all sorts of strange things going on. There are dogs everywhere, but it's not like just dogs photoshopped into images. There are dogs appearing organically out of the image. And it's it's been, you know, a number of people have suggested this is not unlike some kinds of psychedelic experience. It's obviously not exactly the same. It was not designed to be a model of the psychedelic experience. 
but it has some similarities. For us, it was very suggestive because it says, okay, now we can use this kind of method to actually model not just the functions of the brain or, or model perceptual processes in general, but model different kinds of, of perceptual experience, different kinds of, in this case, hallucination. And so we have this, the general slogan that, that comes out of all this is that hallucination is this kind of uncontrolled perception where our, the brain's expectations are not reined in by sensory data, whereas perception is a kind of controlled hallucination where the brain's best guesses are reined in by um, sensory data. So what we've been doing since then and what we're currently doing now is expanding on that work to try and understand a bit more about the diversity of different kinds of hallucinations. And they vary in many different ways. They can be different kinds of complexity. People can hallucinate complex objects or scenes or just simple patterns. They can vary in, their, in how realistic they are, we call this veridicality, whether they seem, whether they have the properties that are similar to normal perceptual content or not. And they can vary in their spontaneity, whether people have hallucinations that's, that come from a, a visual seed that is sort of derived from something out there in, in, in the world, or whether they happen spontaneously. Finally, they can also vary in their experienced reality, whether people experience a hallucination as really being part of the world or not. Uh, and for instance, so in, in some conditions, and, and these aren't just now psychedelic experiences, we're now talking about all kinds of visual hallucinations, uh, including especially those that arise after or, or along with certain neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia, where people often have visual hallucinations. So what we do is we, we now use a different kind of neural network. This is with Kesake and David Schwartzman, Alec Chats. We use a different kind of neural network, which has two components. One is a bit like that first network that I just showed you, which is just very good at classifying images. We can run it forward or backwards. And the other is called a generator network, which is very good at um, recreating an, an input that it's given. And so by combining these networks, uh, and, para and sort of coupling them in different ways, we get a much more flexible platform for simulating different kinds of perceptual experience. And then we can, the idea is we can use those, they basically give us a computational model of what's going on in the brain that would underlie these different kinds of hallucinatory experience. Um, and so we can model, for instance, complex hallucinations, uh, that might arise in, in Parkinson's disease. This is a kind of a complicated image. What I'm showing you here is on the left is a bunch of starting images. And then as we go towards the right, it's what, what the network changes them into after a certain amount of time. So for instance, a bird changes into a, into a, a flower type thing here. So this is, these are very complex images. They're, they're meaningful and they're kind of realistic too. Um, but we can also simulate uh, hallucinations that might appear from visual loss. There's a condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome where people lose central eyesight and tend to have visual hallucinations that are realistic, but are not experienced as being part of the world. We can uh, begin to understand how those arise. And also psychedelic uh, hallucinations that might be both complex or, or simple, more composed of patterns. And if this is just showing you a few movies of how this works in practice. If we simulate, there's a bunch of styling objects and what they end up looking like after running through uh, this process. So it's sort of different from the neurological complex hallucinations. This is Charles Bonnet syndrome where people hallucinate following visual loss. In this case, they have simple geometric hallucinations um, and then different kinds of psychedelic hallucinations. So this is a way of exploring the space of possible uh, visual hallucinations. And what we're now doing is we're actually going back to people who have different kinds of uh, visual hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia and Bonnet syndrome. And we're interviewing them to see if we can map their lived experience of visual hallucination onto uh, our model. In fact, we give them outputs from the model and ask them to try to figure out 
which best matches their experience so we can close the loop and match people's visual experiences to the model so that we can better tune the model to recreate the experiences of these different conditions. Still ongoing work, but it's a way of drilling further down into the computational architecture underlying uh, visual hallucination.